It's time for Bacon and Basketball here on a Saturday morning, the first in the NCAA March Madness of 2024. I am Mike Waddell, joined as always by David Glenn. We're here on the North Carolina Sports Network, and we're focusing in on the Atlantic Coast Conference, which right now, David, is really doing a great job. Four out of five teams still alive. And a lot of conferences out there who got a lot of respect from Joe Lenardi and all of the bracketologists. Well, the SEC being one of them, they just keep falling by the wayside one after the other. The ACC is looking pretty good. No doubt about it, Mike. And it's good to be with you again. It's fun to keep this March Madness ball rolling. Uh, to your point, everybody needs to remember, it is millions of dollars for every bid your league gets. And it's millions more dollars for every game your league wins. And that's just like TV money funnels through these conference offices. So does NCAA tournament basketball money. And yes, it is tied directly to your number of bids and your number of victories over a six-year period. It's kind of a rolling thing. And whereas the ACC has been disappointed to get only five bids this year, five bids last year, five bids the year before that, Remember, last decade, it was seven bids and nine bids, and those are the numbers you want to see as a supersized 15-team league, soon to be, starting next year, an 18-team league. But I've always said that even more important than your number of bids is how well you perform once you get in there. And as you and I dive into Carolina and NC State and Duke, it seems like the triangle is always in the center of this college basketball universe, as I wrote about recently at NC Sports network.com but also the Clemson Tigers are still standing it's it's fun to point out that not only are four of the five ACC entries still standing in this round of 32 that we're about to preview for everybody across North Carolina and beyond but two of those other leagues that did get a lot of love the SEC has already lost number three seed Kentucky number four seed Auburn lost to Yale that one surprised me. Number six seed South Carolina is out. Seven seed Florida is out. Eight seed Mississippi State is out. And that lesser known league that had been getting a lot of love from the talking heads, including many bracketologists, the Mountain West Conference, which some were suggesting was better than the ACC. Just remember, Boise State's out. Colorado State's out. Nevada is out. New Mexico is out. So the SEC and the Mountain West still have a team or two standing, but the ACC has 80% of its five teams still standing. And that performance in March certainly underlines what has been an overwhelmingly strong March Madness performance for the ACC over most of its 71-year history at this point. Four in the top 32. Let's go to the number one seed, North Carolina Tar Heels. On Thursday in the Queen City of Charlotte, they match up against first four winner Wagner. And not much of a game right here. The Tar Heels, big time victors, 90 to 62. This was a beat down from the beginning to the end. Armando Baycott, again, when you're playing against guys who are diminutive, he is going to really shine. But he does seem to get that extra burst of energy when you get to the postseason. R.J. Davis his usual self, the ACC Player of the Year, leading the way with 22 points and making four of seven behind the arc. Yeah, a couple of fun facts just to get us rolling on the Tar Heels as we glance back before we look ahead to that Michigan State matchup. UNC is now 35-2 and all-time in NCAA tournament games played in the state of North Carolina, and that includes 13-1 and in the city of Charlotte. So remember, just as we've reminded our viewers and listeners, that all six of Carolina's NCAA titles have come when they were either a number one seed five different times, or way back in 1957, they hadn't started seeding the field yet. But that Carolina team, of course, was undefeated and would have been a number one seed. Not only do you have a lesser path to success in the NCAA tournament when you earn that number one seed, as the Heels did with an amazing regular season, 
uh, first place finish in the ACC, regular season title, as many call that, but the first 17-3 and three regular season in the ACC's history since they went to that 20-game conference schedule. So it's not only getting a 16-seed Wagner that's more beatable than 15s and 14s and 13s, it's in the modern format getting to play closer to home and 35 and 2 is a pretty impressive number dating in the way dating to the way back machine the heels mostly did what they're supposed to do they defended well holding wagner under 40% from the field they dominated the boards 43 to 24 they limited their turnovers which had been an issue at times lately only 9 for the game against wagner after a shaky start as you said, they dominated the scoring down low, Baycott and otherwise, 48 points in the paint for the Tar Heels to only 20 for Wagner, and they got that partisan crowd into it. There was a lot of Carolina blue in the stands at the Spectrum Center in Charlotte, as there was up in Washington, D.C. at the ACC tournament, but collectively, the Heels did all those things. Baycott, 20 points, 15 rebounds, very efficient from the field and from the line. He actually is now the number two all-time scorer at UNC, passing Phil Ford in that Wagner game. He's behind only Tyler Hansbro, who, oddly enough, was on the call next to James a Jones Angel for the Tar Heel Sports Network in that matchup against Wagner. Uh, he, he also tied – this is a crazy fun fact – Armando Baycott tied Houston Cougars legend Hakeem Olajuwon and Wake Forest legend Tim Duncan with his seventh straight NCAA tournament double-double. Shows how long Armando's been around. R.J. Davis was that ACC player of the year, caliber player, 22 points, also very efficient, 8 for 13 from the field, 4 for 7 on three-pointers. Jalen Withers of Charlotte, North Carolina, in front of the home crowd, Maybe the best game of his entire career. 22 minutes off the bench, 16 points, 10 rebounds. Uh, four seasons at Louisville. I'm not sure he had a better game, certainly not a more important game than what he had for the Tar Heels. Um, he actually had 15 and 10 against his old school Louisville at the Smith Center back in January. Uh, but that was as good as it gets from Jalen Withers off the bench. And whereas Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram – uh, were not great offensively. They played intense defense the whole time, and they were good offensively. Ryan hit two out of six threes. Harrison Ingram hit one out of three threes, or one out of two, excuse me. And those guys had been up and down, or in Ingram's case, very cold from three-point land. As we glance ahead to Michigan State, just quick reminders. Elliot Cadeau, the freshman point guard, did start as usual, but he played only 18 minutes against Wagner. Uh, much closer to that 21 minutes against Duke, 20 minutes against Pitt in D.C. Cadeau had no points, three assists, and four turnovers against a lesser opponent, and he really looked nervous out there. He looks like he's lost his confidence. Good against Florida State at the ACC tournament, bad against Pitt, bad against NC State, and really invisible against Wagner. Uh, a reminder to Carolina fans, one of the reasons R.J. Davis was a first-team All-American in the ACC Player of the Year is that R.J.'s numbers were a lot better when Elliott Cadeau was in the game, taking most of the ball-handling duties off his shoulders, getting the ball to R.J. in the positions where he likes the ball. When Cadeau was not in the game during the regular season, R.J.'s numbers were not nearly as dominant. So I think it's important for the heels as the competition gets tougher for Cadeau to find his mojo again because it's really hard to win or get to a Final Four if your starting point guard uh, has lost his confidence. You can win a national championship with a deferential point guard, right? I mean, the Heels, the Heels have six NCAA titles. I'd argue that three of them came with deferential pass-first point guards. Jimmy Black was that in 1982. Tommy Kearns was that in 1957. Derek Phelps was that in 1993. So the first three were deferential point guards. The more recent ones were kind of scorer-assist combo guys. Raymond Felton in 05, Ty Lawson in 09, Joel Berry in 2017. It can be done either way. But Elliot Cadeau needs to embrace the more deferential approach. He doesn't need to be taking eight, eight to ten shots per game, given the talent around him. He needs to lean into that, accept it, 
and try to make it happen in the coming days and weeks without worrying about what his point totals look like. The one thing I really liked about Cadeau in the post game was that he was accepting of the problem. He wasn't trying to make excuses. He says, I'll do better. And that's the one thing that I love about this kid is that he is a little bit more mature, but he's still a kid. This kid should be in high school right now. He reclassified. So I, I love the way this kid is uh, going to mature, and, and I'm a big Cadeau fan. I like the fact that he doesn't have to score right now, and if he can wade into that. I mean, we've seen a lot of freshman-led teams already exit the tournament. Uh, case in point, somebody we're going to talk about in a little bit, Kentucky. But let's talk about the Heels' next opponent. It will be Michigan State, a rematch of that 2009 NCAA championship game in Detroit. Carolina, of course, with uh, Psycho T, Tyler Hansbro winning that game going away. No Psycho T on this Tar Heel team. And Michigan State is not the same that they were in 2009, but still, it is the old sideline boss, the, 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 the Don himself, Tom Izzo right there. And that puts Michigan State square in the line of a big-time upset potential for the Tar Heels. Yeah, for those planning their weekend, that's a 5.30 matchup today here on this Saturday uh, on CBS. They usually do put the heels on the big channel. Heels, last I saw, are a three-point favorite over the Spartans, which is probably less than some people might guess, given that the heels are a number one seed, the Spartans only a number nine seed. But believe it or not, even though everybody understands Tom Izzo is a very good coach uh, and gets the most out of his players most years, I think it surprises people to learn this fun fact. When it comes to Final Four trips, only Mike Krzyzewski of Duke with 13, John Wooden of UCLA with 12, Dean Smith of Carolina with 11, and Roy Williams of Carolina with 9 have more trips to the Final Four than Tom Izzo of Michigan State. He, he, has, uh, he is in, tied for fifth place in that category. This year's Michigan State team, to me, Mike, is the classic 3 and D opponent. And that makes them dangerous for the Tar Heels. Maybe that's why the spread is so low. The Spartans want to slow the tempo. They want to limit possessions, especially when they're an underdog, as they are to the Tar Heels. They want to make life difficult for you offensively with their ferocious and very physical defense. And then they want to hope they hit enough threes, which this particular Michigan State team does very well. Unlike a lot of other Tom Izzo teams, they can shoot it from three-point land. Uh, they think that combination can help them come out on top even when uh, they're an underdog. In the round of 64, the Spartans absolutely destroyed Mich Mississippi State of the SEC. 69-51, they held them the, the offensively limited Bulldogs to 37% from the field. The Heels obviously have a, have a lot more weapons than the Bulldogs did for the Spartans to deal with. But I want to remind folks, the Spartans were only 10 and 10 in the Big Ten. They finished sixth in that league, and they've actually lost five of their last eight games overall. They lost to Purdue in the Big Ten tournament. They also lost to the Boilermakers and Iowa and Ohio State and Indiana down the stretch of their Big Ten regular season schedule. Those latter three teams did not make the NCAA tournament. So that offers some context for how gettable the Spartans have been lately. Uh, but the Heels have never lost to Michigan State in the NCAA tournament. You mentioned the Final Four. It was Heels over Michigan State in the 2005 Final Four and the Heels over Michigan State in the 2009 Final Four uh, on the way to those two NCAA titles for Roy Williams. Those were, of course, Tom Izzo coached Spartan teams, and he's still in charge. Um, Izzo this year plays a lot of guys. Michigan State has, I think it's 10 healthy players averaging nine or more minutes per game for the season. They do play great defense. They are one of the top 10 teams in the nation in defensive efficiency. And I, the three best players, in my opinion, at Michigan State are seniors. So Carolina fans should watch out for a fifth-year guard named Tyson Walker. He was second-team All-Big Ten, 18 points per game. Their point guard is a guy named A.J. Hogard, 11 points per game, five assists per game. And then they have a fifth-year power forward named Malik Hall, 13 points per game, six rebounds per game. Those three seniors have been teammates for three years. And there's a there's an unorthodox statistic called uh, minutes continuity. 
And real quickly on that, this is why the Spartans are so dangerous. It's easy to look at roster turnover, right? Like eight of the 13 guys from last year have changed. But uh, Ken Palm on his website looks at something called, it's basically rotation turnover. Because it doesn't matter so much if the seven guys at the end of the bench all leave. It does matter if the guys who played a lot of minutes all left. And between the end of last season and the beginning of this season, the five NCAA tournament teams who have the most minutes continuity are Florida Atlantic, Marquette, Wisconsin, Purdue, and these Michigan State Spartans. So they know each other well. They know their coach well. Uh, they usually have four guys on the court who can hit a three-pointer, all but whoever is playing center at a given time. Uh, they have a defender named Jaden Aikens, 6'4 guard, that I wonder if they're going to put him on R.J. Davis, given that Aikens would have about four inches and a height advantage uh, over R.J. We'll see how that plays out. Um, but Michigan State's best wins of the season made them look really good. They beat Baylor back in mid-December. That's a very good Baylor team. They beat Illinois in East Lansing back in mid-February. But I also remind people, the Spartans lost to most of their best opponents. Purdue twice, Wisconsin twice. They lost to Duke. They lost to Arizona. They lost to Nebraska. They lost to Northwestern. They lost to James Madison. Uh, the Heels are the better team here, especially offensively. But they have to go out there and prove it. And they have to get through those two barriers, one, Elliot Cadeau finding his mojo, and the other, they just can't afford against better teams, uh, cold shooting nights from both Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram. Carolina has already beaten Michigan State on Friday in the women's bracket, the 8-9 game. Carolina, the 9 seed, beat Michigan State, the 8 seed, 59-56. to But big thing right here. You talk about in the day and age of the portal, losing players from one school to another and sometimes having to come back and play against your school. Well, North Carolina lost their chancellor, Kevin Guskowitz, uh -huh. to Michigan State. He started back on the 14th, so that was nine days ago. He officially started in East Lansing. So he started this season wearing Carolina blue, and now he's in the tournament. He's already 0-1 against the Tar Heels, and now it'll be that uh, same matchup again. It'll be interesting to see how uh, that all works out. He's just meeting the players, and some of the Michigan State guys were saying, oh, we didn't know where he came from, but uh, he said hello and how you doing? So that was pretty cool. But, uh, hey, man, Kevin's a great fella, and a lot of people in Chapel Hill uh, credit him with a lot of uh, very strong things that went on the campus culture side during his short tenure, four or five years as the uh, chancellor in Chapel Hill. So it ought to be a, a fun little stat to watch there. I know you like that kind of stuff. Oh, no doubt about it. And if we have to pick, I think he's going to go 0-2 against his former school. Yeah. Uh, but again, the heels, while the better team, and because the heels' defensive foundation is so strong, I think they should be the favorite. I think they will win. But Carolina's offense is a little harder to predict on many nights and against this Michigan State defense, they're going to need either Ryan or Ingram to hit some threes. They usually can count on Armando Baycott inside and R.J. Davis outside. And that reliability is one of the many reasons that the Heels are so tough to beat. That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. This is Bacon and Basketball. When we come back on this show here, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council, we'll be talking about NC State and how the Wolfpack keeps on rolling and rolling here in the month of March. This is the North Carolina Sports Network, and now this from our good friends at High Street, Lawson Insurance Group. The Lawson Insurance Group in Raleigh is a family-owned business led by three actual brothers who happen to be huge sports fans, Ken Lawson, Miller Lawson, and Michael Lawson. I know these guys, I trust these guys, and I send these guys my own insurance business and that of my family. The next time you have insurance needs, I hope you'll do the same. The Lawson Insurance Group is known for its commitment to community and its dedication to ensuring that North Carolinians and their businesses are prepared for life's inevitable challenges with the reminder that as a high street insurance partner, Lawson Insurance Group offers local expertise 
and support that combined with High Street's extensive national resources means more choice and support for you as their client. To learn more, search Lawson Insurance Group online. The Lawson Insurance website will be the first link that pops up. Well, the 2024 Wolfpack continues their 1983 impersonation tour as they roll to a big win in their sixth straight, 80-67, to over the Red Raiders of Texas Tech the other night. And now they come back to play a really big game against Oakland. We'll talk about the Golden Grizzlies and their hot shooting guard from Division II land in a few minutes. But Hey, what about the Wolfpack right here? And what about our man, Mo Diara? He just keeps on going and going and going. This is a Wolfpack team that has certainly found an extra jolt of energy so far here in the month of March. Yeah, and remember, this is a Wolfpack team that just won as an 11 seed. We haven't seen a lot of that in this year's big dance. After, of course, the Wolfpack became the lowest seed in ACC tournament history, a number 10 to win that championship and cut down those nets. So it was Wolfpack 80, Texas Tech 67, 11 seed over 6 seed. And, of course, I gave you some fun facts related to the Tar Heels win over Wagner. I have to give you some fun facts related to the Wolfpack uh, win over the Red Raiders. Kevin Keats gets the first NCAA tournament victory of his entire head coaching career. He had lost all four of his openers in his previous trips – twice when he was at UNC Wilmington as the head coach, and again in year one and year six, just a year ago, at NC State. Just four days after leading the Wolfpack to its first ACC title in 37 years, Keats fills basically the other biggest hole on his resume, a victory in the big dance. Another fun fact. This sounds crazy, but it underlines that cardiac pack nature of this story that you just referred to. In their first 33 games this season, the Wolfpack had only two victories over NCAA tournament caliber opponents. They beat UVA in Raleigh, and they beat the Clemson Tigers at Clemson. Now the Wolfpack has four such victories in their last four games. They beat Duke up in D.C., they beat Virginia in D.C., and of course they beat Carolina in that ACC title game. Now they've beaten Texas Tech in the NCAA tournament. One more fun fact for you. All of the biggest surprise ACC tournament champions of the past, and I mean Wally Walker and the Virginia Cavaliers in 1976, Jimmy V and the other Cardiac Pack, that 1987 group that won the most recent ACC title prior to this year's team, Gary Williams in the 2004 Maryland Terrapins, who had a losing record during the regular season, but cut down the nets at the ACC tournament as a surprise champion. And then even Virginia Tech two years ago, which was the number seven seed and on the outside of the NCAA tournament bubble, and they shocked the world in their own way with that victory just two years ago by the Hokies. All four of those other surprise ACC champions really flopped at the ACC tournament. They all either lost their first game or their second game, and obviously the 2024 Wolfpack uh, has different ideas. You know the deal here, Mike. I don't know if I can't think of another team in ACC history that would fit this description. All seven Wolfpack, I'll call them rotation players. They occasionally use an eighth or a ninth guy, but the seven guys who play the most for the Wolfpack are all major college transfers, and five of the seven are new to the Wolfpack this year. Mo Diaras from Missouri, Michael O'Connell's from Stanford, DJ Horns from Arizona State, Ben Middlebrooks is from Clemson, Jaden Taylor's from Butler, and then the two holdovers, Casey Morcells, formerly of UVA, DJ Burns is formerly of both Tennessee and Winthrop. That's never happened before. And that adds one more layer to all the firsts 
that we're describing with this year's NC State Wolfpack. And somehow they have come together at exactly the right time. Just as we mentioned Jalen Withers with that sensational performance off the bench for the Tar Heels in Charlotte in that victory over Wagner. How about backup big man Ben Middlebrooks? The guy's a five-point-per-game guy in his first year with the Wolfpack after that time at Clemson. He puts up a career-high 21 points against the Red Raiders, six for eight from the field, nine or ten from the free-throw line, four rebounds, couple of steals, couple of block shots. I would argue it was the best game of his college career at exactly the right time. And he's a three-year college player, just like Withers you know, is an even longer-tenured college player. These guys are saving their best for exactly the right time. Meanwhile, another theme continues. Starting forward, Mo Diara, starting point guard, Michael O'Connell. They were not huge parts of the rotation early this season. There were games where they only got a handful of minutes, three minutes, eight minutes, 13 minutes. Obviously, they've been playing 35 minutes plus lately, and they have been the ones to help Kevin Keats find the right chemistry. Diara played 39 minutes against Texas Tech, put up a double-double, 17 points, 12 rebounds. O'Connell played 37 minutes against Texas Tech, did not score a single point, but didn't care. And that's so important. It's Elliot Cadeau needs to study Michael O'Connell because O'Connell had six assists without a single turnover, but has a mentality that he doesn't have anything to prove. It's about winning. And when DJ Burns is down low, like Baycott is down low for Cadeau, or DJ Horn is on the wing, like RJ Davis is on the wing for Cadeau, it's best to defer. And that DJ Burns guy had 16 points against Texas Tech, seven for 11 from the field, as he continues to be an incredibly difficult guy to defend in the low post. That DJ Horn guy, 16 points, six rebounds, five assists. He's given up the ball when the pressure in, in is in his grill, and I think he's finding teammates better than he was finding teammates earlier this season when the Wolfpack was not winning as much because they weren't helping each other get as many open shots. Casey Marcel played great defense against the Texas Tech team that has several very talented guards. Remember, we said that Pop Isaacs, was not a great three-point shooter this year, and all the Texas Tech fans started mocking us on our Twitter account. Did you notice what Pop Isaacs did? He went one for 10 from three-point land. That means we knew the scouting report better than Texas Tech fans knew their own personnel. Pop Isaacs can be a streaky three-point shooter, but he was bad this year. Bad. If you're shooting less than 30% from three-point land and taking a lot of threes, you're hurting your team. By definition, he was one for 10 on threes, three for 16 field goals because of the defense of Casey Marcel and others, and because he had more confidence in his three-point shot than his season-long statistics suggested that he should have had. Kevin Keats, remember, said that one of the biggest changes in the Wolfpack after losing seven of those last nine regular season games, remember, was cutting out, cutting down on their mistakes. The pack had only 10 turnovers against Texas Tech. So what's the equation? Fewer turnovers, much better and smarter shot selection, more unselfishness on offense, more energy and intensity on defense. They just look like they care more on that side of the ball. Equals what? Clicking chemistry and much, much more efficient basketball than the, the pack was playing earlier this year. Finally, on this one, before we look forward to the Pack's matchup against Oakland, the Wolfpack is playing, I think, with smarter. They're taking fewer three-point shots, but they're making a higher percentage because they're smarter three-point shots. Five for 13. Instead of hunting your three-point shot, you take it in rhythm when the pass comes to you and you're open and you can take it. They're also playing, again, with that greater defensive intensity. The pack was only 10th in the ACC out of 15 teams in defensive efficiency during the regular season. They're better than that now. They're attacking the basket. They're getting to the free throw line instead of just settling for jumpers. They got 42 points in the paint to only 20 against the Red Raiders. And they were 21 of 26 on free throws in that game. They're doing everything right. And Texas Tech is a good team with good guards. And the pack had to play well to win. They end up winning by 13, 
because they have found their chemistry. They built on what they started in Washington, D.C., and they didn't face plant or, or be exhausted by the emotion of victory the way some of those other surprise ACC champions have been in the past. Well, now NC State, who has been the upstart, who has been the underdog, becomes the favorite. They're six and a half point favorites going into tonight's game, 7 10 p.m., the game on TBS and True TV against the Oakland Golden Grizzlies. Now, Oakland is led by a guy named Jack Gawkey. To me, he looks like one of those guys out of Hoosiers. A white guy, you know, block haircut, and he just guns it out. 10 of 20 behind the arc. Look, man, I mean, the likelihood of this guy going off again, if he goes off again Seth Curry style, he's going to just be – they're just going to make him into a god in the state (laughs) of Michigan. But but this is a challenge – for North Carolina State now to accept the fact that, hey, we're the ACC champions. Hey, we just beat Texas Tech. Hey, we're we're legit. We have a shot to go to the Sweet 16. It's a real challenge for Kevin Keats to get his team on the right mental plane, but you hit on it a second ago. This is not a team of youngsters like Kentucky that is already back in Lexington. This NC State team, they might be a hodgepodge, the, you know, a Brady bunch of guys that have come together, but they're guys that have been in games. They're older dudes. And and they understand that a lot of these guys aren't going to have a tomorrow on this continent to play basketball. So this is their time. But again, you go from an underdog to being the favorite all of a sudden, and sometimes, you know, it can uh, creep up on you. What, what do you think about the uh, challenge that Oakland will present for the ACC champion Wolfpack? Yeah, I have a couple of fun facts here after a couple of reminders. Number one, you can't have bracket luck. We'll see if it plays out that way. But if I were a Wolfpack fan, I would rather play Oakland, with all due respect, oh, than yeah. a Kentucky team that has four or five future NBA draft picks in Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham and Justin Edwards and DJ Wagner and even possibly others. Now, again, credit Oakland for eliminating those Wildcats. But if I had my pick, I would have rather played Oakland. They are the lowest seed left in this field as a number 14 seed. And in the Ken Palm efficiency rankings, Oakland is the lowest ranked team remaining in this NCAA tournament. They were ranked number 130 nationally out of 362 teams. Every team still standing in the round of 32 is higher in those efficiency rankings. That doesn't mean Oakland can't win. It just means they, I believe, are a significantly less talented team than Kentucky, of course, And theoretically, that makes them a little less difficult to beat. Not easy, but less difficult to beat. Fun fact, since you mentioned the Sweet 16 possibility. Since the 1980s, when, remember, the Wolfpack had the Cardiac Pack NCAA title of 1983, but they also had other success, right? They won regular season championships. They won that ACC tournament in 1987. Since the 80s, 90s and forward meaning, NC State's only been to the Sweet 16 three times in that, what, 34-year period. So this is rarefied air. you got to grab this opportunity while it's in front of you. They did it in 2005 under a guy named Herb Sendek, and they did it twice under Mark Gottfried, 2012 and 2015. That was as far as they got. There were no Elite Eights in any of those cases, but... Just as winning the ACC tournament is the ultimate rarefied air given modern Wolfpack history, we're in some relatively rarefied air as the Wolfpack is that favorite over the Golden Grizzlies of Oakland. Quick congratulations to Greg Campy, the guy, the head coach of Oakland, which if you don't know, is located in Michigan, not too far from the city of Detroit. Greg Campy is 68 years old. He is in his 40th year at Oakland. He actually oversaw the school's transition from being a Division II basketball program about 25 years ago to being, of course, a Division I program now. But this is only his fourth trip to the Division I NCAA tournament in these 25 years. And the Kentucky victory was just his second win ever in the Division I 
uh, NCAA tournament. The other one was a first four game way back in 2005. Oakland was the Horizon League champion. They played a very tough non-conference schedule, and that's why their record is not a glowing one. They started 6-8 and eight this year. So through 14 games, they had won six and lost eight. But those losses included games against the likes of Illinois, NCAA tournament team, Drake, NCAA tournament team, Michigan State, Carolina's opponent today, NCAA tournament team, and the Dayton Flyers, another NCAA tournament team. Now the Golden Grizzlies, and this, this confidence factor matters with James Madison, the Duke opponent we'll talk about later, uh, but also NC State's opponent today. The Golden Grizzlies are 18-3 and three in their last 21 games. So you see a 24-11 and 11 record overall, and maybe that doesn't look overwhelming, but they were the regular season horizon champs, the tournament title champs. They were 13-point underdogs against the Kentucky team loaded with that NBA talent, but they got it done. They're 18-3 and three in their last 21 games, and they believe they can win, which is a very important element at this time of the year. At the same time, if I'm Kevin Keats, I'm reminding my guys also, Oakland did not beat a single NCAA tournament caliber team during the entire regular season. Their best non-conference win during the regular season was against Xavier which did not have a winning record this year. The Horizon League was not a great league this year. So they're the Horizon League champs, but they are and should be the underdog to the ACC champs. You mentioned Jack Golke. I wonder if Casey Marcel, ace defender, formerly of UVA, very good on the perimeter. Jack Golke is about 6'3". Casey Marcel is about a similar size. I have a feeling that he knows the scouting report, right? Just like the Wolfpack studied their scouting report against Texas Tech in a way that I think was better than their attention to detail for much of the regular season. They know that almost all of Jack Golke's shots this year are, are three-point attempts. I think oh, yeah. all, tw all 20 of his shots in that win over Kentucky were three-pointers, and he made 10 of them. That was his career high, by the way, 32 points against the Wildcats. He's and then shocking. he was – <laughs> he, he, he was the guy who stared at the camera after beating Kentucky and said, by the way, we're not a Cinderella. But he was the sixth man of the year in the Horizon League. He's not a total fluke. He is a Division II transfer, but he made almost 40% of his threes during the regular season. And his 131 threes, Mike, led all of Division I men's basketball. So this is a guy who's got to be in your scouting report. But uh, Oakland's best player is a guy named Trey Townsend. He's 6'6", six, six, about 230, Horizon League Player of the Year. It's unusual to have a guy lead the team in scoring and rebounding and assists, but that's what he did for Oakland this year. He also hits about 35% of his threes. It could be a matchup problem for the Wolfpack because 6'6", six, six, 230, I mean, maybe you put Mo Diara on him, who's a taller, long guy. Uh, but but I don't know. Uh, Mo often guards bigger guys than that, and the Wolfpack guards may not be tall and long enough to deal with 6'6", 230, Trey Townsend. So that's a big decision for Kevin Keats. Uh, the Wolfpack is not as good, remember, defensively when DJ Burns is in the game. As brilliant as he is in other ways, uh, he is he's just a big guy who's a little slow afoot, uh, and he's not a shot blocker near the rim. So it's probably going to be Diara on Townsend. That'll be a matchup to watch. But the third key player for Oakland is a guy named Blake Lampman. He's a 6'3 guard. He was second team all Horizon League. He made 37% of his threes. So the bottom line to me is that the Wolfpack must exploit Oakland in the paint. They only have one big guy. He's a junior forward named Chris Conway. He's about 6'9", 225. DJ Burns has probably 50 pounds on him, right? The Wolfpack must explode, o exploit Oakland in the paint, maybe try to get Conway in foul trouble, and then Oakland has nobody to deal with D.J. Burns or Mo Diara for that point, for that matter. Run the Grizzlies off the three-point line. We know they do that well. Force them to put the ball on the floor and execute a smart team defense plan against the Grizzlies the way you did exactly that in beating the, the Red Raiders of Texas Tech by double digits. Oakland only played six guys for heavy minutes against Kentucky. And again, only one of those guys was over six foot six. Diara's what, 6'10 or 11? 
DJ Burns, 6'9", 275, or whatever they list him as. It is a huge opportunity in the post. One of the reasons the Wolfpack is the ACC champion is that at times they beat you with DJ Horn from the guard position. At times they beat you with Mo DR as double-doubles. At times they beat you because you couldn't defend DJ Burns in the post. He was either going to score or find an open shooter. I think it starts offensively in the post for the Wolfpack. They have the advantage there over Oakland. And then defensively, it's just time to execute another smart game plan. Know who the shooters are and make them try to put the ball on the floor rather than uh, add to those record three-point numbers in the case of Jack Golke. So our two games here on the first round of 32 uh, day, Saturday, North Carolina and Michigan State. That game, a 5.30 start on CBS Carolina, as David said, a three-point favorite. Then coming up a little bit later, it'll be NC State and Oakland, 7, 10 p.m. start on TBS and the Wolfpack, a six-and-a-half-point spread. Ought to be a lot of fun. David, we're going to say good afternoon right now as people get ready for these games between the Tar Heels and the Wolfpack and their opponents. Uh, tonight, we'll be back later on this evening with a little Duke and Clemson preview for their games coming up on Sunday. Right now, for David Glenn, I'm Mike Waddell. This has been Bacon and Basketball right here, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council on the North Carolina Sports Network.